Hello, this is Stephen. And this is Megan. And this is the Synchrony Podcast, where we talk about transforming apostolic dating culture and ending loneliness in the church. Babe, this is episode number eight. Eight. And on a very auspicious weekend. Yes. What weekend is that? Day. Well, number one, it's Easter weekend. So (laughs) we're recording this the day before we, you know, the Lord rises again, metaphorically. Uh, But that is not the excitement that we're talking about, as exciting as that is. We're talking about... Launch. Launch. Launch is happening. Actually, as of the time that this episode drops, it will it's happening today. It's right now. Right, right now as you're listening. Right now. If you're listening on Monday, April 1st, when this drops. This is the last day. You are literally inside the cockpit of the space shuttle being launched into outer space as we speak. That's... Or into a relationship. <laughs> I don't know if I like I don't like the image of, no, I'm just, of just like yeeting someone at someone of the opposite sex like yeah, yee, yeah. yeah. no anyway okay <laughs> we're launching we probably shouldn't have had so much sugar before we sat down into no, this this is great we need this our yeah. last one was like we were so exhausted yeah that's true um so the launch this is really exciting guys if you have been following us for any period of time you've heard us talk about it um what we're launching is a updated and reprised and much more full suite of services as part of our matchmaking process. So if you were involved in our beta testing group, then you might have taken a survey and done a consultation and have been introduced to a couple of people. And we've learned a lot from that beta testing process. We've gotten better at what we're doing. Um, and hopefully we found more ways to add value to the community as we make this a more robust process for them. So our launch uh, is going to make available not just the actual matchmaking process, but also the Synchrony community, which is a really big deal. And I think something that's going to totally transform how we're interacting with people um, and helping them to connect with others. So that's a, a closed online forum. Um, it's administrated by you know me and Stephen. And it's only open to people who have gone through the synchrony consultation process. So it's a nice cozy group and you can rest assured that everyone in there is who they say they are and um, has sort of been vetted by us. Um, But we're going to be doing a lot of stuff in that community space. So we're kicking off with a launch party. Woot woot. Yep. That is happening tonight if you're listening to this on April 1st. Yep. Tonight, 730 Eastern. Uh, So... If you are already part of the Synchrony community, put it on your calendars. Make sure you come hang out. Bring a snack if you want. And it's not a prank. Not a prank, yeah. Not an April's <laughs> Fool's joke. Um, so we're going to get together and do our launch party tonight. And really, that's going to be us just kind of setting the vision for the project and doing some fun stuff and getting to know people a little bit more. Um, but we're also going to be putting a lot more stuff out into that community. So we have some courses in progress that are going to help Actually, people. Actually, too, right? Yeah, yeah, tentatively, that are going to help people... Um, just really put a bunch more tools in their dating toolkit, right? Yeah. Because our mission ultimately is not just to match make people through synchrony. It's to make them better at dating in a godly way. Yeah. Um, so hopefully, about that. hopefully they learn something from this process that they can use in their own daily life. Yeah. And maybe find someone outside of us. Yeah. I'd love that too. So we're looking to just equip people in whatever way we can We're also going to be hopefully doing some recurring like social meetup events on that. And we already have some stuff going on, like where you can do challenges and interact with each other. It's really fun. So that's uh, one of the main things we're adding. But there's more to come that I'm excited to share with folks. I'm just going to leave a teaser here. If you haven't gotten involved in the Synchrony Project yet, or if you're looking at the price of matchmaking and just kind of going like, I can't do that right now. I also want to encourage you that going through our matchmaking pipeline and buying a consultation is not the only way that we're going to be kind of adding value. So um, I'm not going to say exactly what should be dropping today because I want to make sure it's in good shape before we do it. (laughs) But we should have some cool free stuff dropping today as part of our launch um, that we're hoping people will kind of pick up and run with. So follow us on socials and keep an eye out and let us know what you think. Please do. It's exciting. So babe, This is going to be an episode that I think 
uh, I'm mostly going to be interviewing you about. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So try to keep it, you know, PG. I'll say I'll try to keep it G-rated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, G-rated. We're apostolics. What am I saying? <laughs> um. I want to talk about male involvement in the Synchrony Project. Specifically, as we're talking, you know, we're talking about the launch and people who were involved. If you've listened to any of our episodes before, you've probably heard that we have a relatively high number of women compared to men in the project. And some of that we've talked about is about access, right? Yeah. It's about like the algorithm and where our stuff gets filtered and the avenues that it gets filtered through and just the proportion of apostolic women who are on social media compared to men, I think. Yeah. But I think there's something else that's impacting it, and I want to talk about that today. So let me start off with this question. Based on your experience talking to men about matchmaking, do you think they're generally hesitant to try something like this, and why? From the guys I've talked to that are in the market, (laughs) um, I think there is a little bit of a hesitation. I mean, it's a mixed bag. You mm-hmm. have some people that are excited about it, that are open, more open-minded to it. Um, but then you have some people that have a me- they immediately say it takes the hunt out of it, or it takes the mm. the the pursue the pursuing aspect out of the relationship, which often guys perceive to that be their job. You said two things that are really important that I want to bring up. So one is the idea of the hunt, right? And that's a metaphor that we've heard used for dating for a long time. Yeah. Right. Um, as a woman, that's a difficult metaphor to get behind because it makes it, you know, the, the idea of the, the thrill of the chase, right? Or the hunt. Yeah. It makes the woman in this scenario out to be prey something that is caught (laughs) or trapped yeah sure and that's a little difficult but i also think it connotes like you know men who hunt who who catch game there's like a certain level of masculinity that comes with that right like in our western american association men who go out and hunt or who uh chase or who pursue there's there's a level of um we like we associate that with being manly Right. I'm making stereotypes here. I know that sure. not everyone's going to be like <laughs> yeah, okay. wearing camo on the weekends and stuff <laughs> like that. I'm not trying to say that every manly man has to go out and get bloody and dirty every weekend. Um, but I think that's an interesting point, because what you're saying is that. The the dating world, as men have been taught to perceive it. Is very much about them acting out. One specific flavor of masculinity. Do you feel like I'm taking that too far? Like, does that make sense? I think that's fine. I think that's okay to say, but I think societally it is kind of at least perceived to be put on the man. Yeah. And so what what happens is if you say, Hey, you know, I need help finding someone. Mm -hmm. Is that making me less of a man? Right. You know, or are people going to think of me differently? Mm -hmm. And I think that's an aspect that isn't necessarily conscious. Sure. You know, like you don't, I don't think you're consciously going, oh, I don't need help. But when you first hear matchmaking, there might be a little bit of a hit to like even consider it a hit to my pride or a hit Mm -hmm. to who I am as a person initially, because what kind of a woman wants a man that needs help? Ooh, wow. That's a really good question. Because is this fair to say that from a man's perspective, needing help is a form of weakness? To some people, yeah. Yeah. Or has been, um, I'd not say to a man's perspective, in the way that our culture has sort of um, painted masculinity. And when I say culture here, I'm talking about Western American Yeah, culture. sure. I think it's it, to, to, to generalize men mm-hmm. and to say all of them feel that way would be unfair. That's dangerous, yeah. Yeah, it's very unfair. Um, but what I'm talking about is there's not a book written on how to, I mean, I guess there is, there are books written, but there's not a perfect way to 
find someone. There's not like a, you don't like turn 13 and get like a field guide. Yeah, exactly. There's like, not a field guide for lighting a, a fire a, in the woods. A YouTube you know, video series. That's what I'm saying. So like, this is something that I think is expected to be inherent mm -hmm. and it's not. Yeah. Okay. So that idea of something being inherent, I think what you're getting at is that we expect men to operate on a male instinct about yes. some of these things. Yeah. And like, go, I'm going to go to the stereotype of like men who don't ask for directions, right? Which is like <laughs> a common joke in our culture, right? That yeah. men won't ask for directions on a road trip. And sure. women are like, ask for directions, pull over here, talk to this person. And I was like, no, I can figure it out myself. And it's just, it's sort of like a silly yeah. corollary. But the idea is that from the male perspective, he should be able to figure out where, you're, where he's going based on his sense of direction, right? And yeah. his instinct about where things are. And as a woman, particularly myself as a woman who could get lost inside a brown paper bag. Um, Quite literally. It's so bad. Um, you know, I'm I'm open to helping or to asking for help with that because I'm not expected to have an instinct that could operate in that space. And there's all kinds of sexism baked into that idea. Oh, sure. All of these, th all these concepts we're talking about, we don't necessarily agree with, I want to say. Yeah, I, I, think they're, I think they're ultimately harmful. Yeah, but I know as me as a teenager, like it was expected of me to like know how to pursue a woman correctly. Mind you, my dad died when I was 12. So right, with I didn't no really... instruction whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, I didn't quite have an example set before me. And not everyone has good examples set for them either. Yeah, that, yeah that's so good. And so it's it's kind of unfortunate for people to put pressure on themselves in a way or to know something that they quite literally could not have known. Mm, yeah. So we we're we're raising these young men in societies that tell them they should be able to know the things they should know, right? That they should have this inherent instinct, as you yeah. put it. Um, we're not giving them clear instructions about how to go about doing it, right? Yep. Um and then we're treating it as something that they need to do on their own, right? We don't even, like, we, we kind of even laugh off the concept of having a wingman, right? Which is yeah. the only kind of, like, permissible assistance I think guys oh, sure. can have in dating. Like, and it's considered to be kind of an immature thing that you would do in, like, high school or college. Not something that, you know, a mature man would do, I think. Would a would Brad technically have been my wingman? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he came on that that Duffy's that was supposed to be ice cream Duffy's date. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, so for context, I think if you heard our, the episode about our dating story, Stephen and I went on like I guess like three or four dates, and I just thought we were hanging out because he was just very friendly. And you also didn't pay for my food. Not that that's which is another stereotype about how men and women interact. Sure, and I think well the first couple that we went on. We were just hanging out. Yeah. You didn't know I was doing it with intentions to quote unquote pursue you. So this is an interesting point. Like. But I think I think me paying for your food adds pressure. It does. But that would have been one of the signals I would have expected to start seeing to tell me, oh, he likes me like that. Oh, sure. So what we're getting at here is that like the signals are unclear. Right. We're not giving young men or men in general uh, the right guide map to how to go about doing this. We're expecting them to figure out how to date based off of some kind of inherent instinct that I don't think actually exists because our dating and mate selection practices are not, are not timeless things that all humans have done the same way forever. They're very cultural. Yeah. Right. If you know, if you want to talk nature versus nurture, I don't think deciding who gets to pay for the meal and what that means was something that the Lord placed into the heart of Adam right <laughs> yeah so like it seems like this is an area where men could benefit from guidance yeah but I think the cultural barriers to asking for that guidance are really really hard to get around sure so I want to talk about other places in life where it's normal for men to ask for help in places where they recognize that a different perspective or a different level of skill is needed. Okay. Um, and I have a few that I wrote down. I want to get your thoughts about how they map to like the matchmaking experience. Sure. So, Go for it. Okay. This one actually came from my dad. So shout out to my dad who listens. Um, 
he compared what we're doing as matchmakers to somebody who uses a fishing guide. Yep. And if you know my dad, <laughs> the man would rather be somewhere on the water with a pole in hand than just about anywhere else. It's like, very true. Yeah. Um, so he he says that, you know, matchmaking is like using a fishing guide because our responsibility as matchmakers is to take people to the, you know, to give them access to people that they might not normally meet in the same way that a fishing guide will take someone who's unfamiliar with that particular waterway to the place where the fish are. Yeah. What I love about this parallel is every level mm -hmm. of fishing skill uses a fishing guide. What do you mean? When you go to a new area. If, oh, if you're okay. wanting to catch trophy fish mm -hmm. or if you're wanting to catch, um, you know, if you're not wanting to go to waste your time is what I mean. <laughs> We're not. We're not comparing women to fish. Just no, uh, that's no, where the sorry. metaphor dies off. Just letting you know, guys. No, go it, ahead. It's not. But oh, I'm saying, if you're going to be serious fishermen mm -hmm. in an area you've never been before, yeah, and you only have a certain amount of time to do it, you're not mm -hmm. going to waste your time and fuel driving around your boat looking for a spot, mm. wishing to find a random location. Yeah, unless you have weeks to scout it out prior. Right. Or you could hire someone who literally knows the area like the back of their hand and know where every fish beds and in which season they do it. And they can take you to all the areas that they know or even seek out multiple fishing guides if you want to be really serious about it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what's really cool about that parallel is just we're not saying that you are unable to find someone on your own. We're just saying matchmaking might increase your chances to go straight to the right pool of people that you want to be looking for. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like a fisherman who is extremely skilled is not less of a skilled fisherman because he uses a guide. Yeah. Right. If anything, he's more knowledgeable about the complexities of what he's doing. Yeah. And he's going to rely on the expertise of someone who knows. Like there's a, there's, yeah, he you know, knows that that person that he's hiring has spent dozens if not hundreds if not thousands of hours in that area mm -hmm. finding all of these spots right whereas him or he or she has been in that area for a whopping couple hours right and they could be taken right to these locations right. for the so future the level of knowledge is just totally different yeah. but what i think is really important for that like if we're taking the metaphor back to matchmaking yeah asking for help in dating doesn't mean you're going to be a bad husband or a bad oh absolutely not boyfriend or a bad romantic partner. No. But going back to the efficiency that I talked about in a previous episode, I absolutely love the idea of a fishing slash hunting guide. Mm. Because, again, if you are wanting to date seriously, and this goes for any non-Christians too. Yeah. Um, if you're wanting to date seriously and with people who are like mindsets, and I don't mean just spiritually. Mm -hmm. I also mean emotionally, uh, financially values aligned, values aligned and also relationally aligned. What this does is it brings you to a pool of people who all are at least say willing to say, I want to find someone that has a similar mindset as me. Yeah. Not necessarily like I have to find someone who is like me in particular. I'm saying you are going to go to a pool of people who has aligned values. Mm -hmm. And you know that they also want to take dating seriously too. Right. Hopefully these people are not going to waste your time. Right. Whereas if you just ran randomly meet any Joe Schmo, you don't know their intentions. Right. I'm not saying you can't trust people out in the wild, what's but the, what's the female equivalent of Joe Schmo? Jeanette Schmidt? I don't know. Jane jo Doe? Josephine <laughs> Schmosephine? <laughs> sure. But yeah, so anyways, I love this parallel. Yeah, and so if you again, want Again, not to compare you to trophy deer or fish. But, right. But I, it's the it's the time efficiency thing. Right. I take issue with being compared to some kind of game animal that needs trapping, but <laughs> if you like the metaphor of the thrill of the chase or the thrill of the hunt when it comes to dating, great hunters and great fishermen use great guides. Yeah. 
and it just makes more sense. But I mean, just to reiterate it a little bit, but going to a hunting, more a hunting analogy, that's yeah. actually fixed a little bit better because you can find, you know, a lot of fish in your region, generally mm-hmm. speaking. You're usually going to a new location to find fish that you never would have other found before. Mm-hmm. Same thing with hunting. Like usually you travel out of state to mm-hmm. hunt something that's not in your region. Yeah. My dad has, has this sort of like long-term dream of hunting elk. Oh, and I absolutely want to hang on to his coattails and go on that trip too. Yeah, I bet. Uh, it's beautiful. But it requires, I mean, you have to really find someone who knows what you're doing. That's the thing. You're spending tens of thousands of dollars on this trip. And it's risky if you make a mistake. Yeah. Like that's something we haven't talked about. But relationship risks are expensive in terms of not only the emotional cost to you, yeah, but the time and energy and the social issues that come up if you make a, a poor choice about dating. Yeah. And I think that's, as you know, when, when you're dealing with something as risky as who you spend your life with. Yeah. It's good to have a good guide. Yeah. And okay. so just to finish, con- to conclude this point, when you go to Colorado, you are going there to find something that you do not have in Florida. Mm. And so matchmaking, all it's doing is providing a pool of people that you most likely would have never met otherwise. Yep. Because we're already in still over 43 states, I think. Mm-hmm. And we are we now have people that are out of the country as well, which is a whole other hurdle to talk about later. But like, there are so many people in this that you would have never met otherwise. Yeah. So why not give it a shot? Yeah. Thanks, Dad. Great thought. Thanks. Shout Take out me. To... I would not. I want to go on the elk hunt with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> plug. Subtle plug. Uh, my dad's the coolest. Okay. Um, another one that I wanted to call out was personal training. Mm-hmm. So if you are a man and you want to build a particular kind of physique or you want your body to perform differently. This actually might work better for me to ask you this because you just got done doing stuff with Andrew for a while. Oh, yeah. Andrew is my weightlifting coach. Yeah, but you can still use it for the same example. Yeah. Like what sorry to flip the question on you mid <laughs> mid podcast but what did you get out of personal training that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise oh my goodness um compared to matchmaking yeah so for some context i worked with a a weightlifting coach who trained um college olympic weightlifting teams he was yeah. he had a phd he was extremely knowledgeable um, so I don't want to try to compare what I know about matchmaking to his knowledge of weightlifting. <laughs> no, but still. Yeah, but what it gave me working with him and like the whole group that he was working with. He had micro classes and he had like five to ten people. Yeah, and he it was, was awesome. and he had training sessions for like an hour blocks throughout the whole entire day. Yeah. And so you would be usually going with the same people every class. But so he cool. was very pretty one-on-one like he could stop what he was doing and coach you on your form and everything like that yeah I mean it changed my life but I think the the key things that I got from it that would have been totally different at any other gym one I had confidence right because I felt like Andrew was in my corner it's amazing to have a coach who believes in you and I never really did sports so like that wasn't really a thing I I did bible quizzing which I did have great coaches there but it's different right physical performance is not an area where I feel confident at all Um, And having a great coach like Andrew was really important to me because it gave me the sense that I could do things I hadn't tried before. I could do new things. I could push my limits. Yeah. And I think from the perspective of matchmaking, I mean. And he also knew your goals. Yeah, he did. He knew. He knew where you wanted to push yourself towards. Right. And Which then he catered the workouts towards what you were looking for. Yeah. And my particular... um, sort of limitations and challenges you know he coached me through my second pregnancy oh yeah that's true so um he he really understood what my body was capable of how I wanted it to improve um and it it did amazing things for my confidence because you know I felt like I had someone who knew what they were talking about first of all like he was an authority on what I was doing so I trusted his advice um but also you know, I was doing stuff that I had never done before yeah. until I, when I, before I walked into that gym. You I had never deadlifted before. I had never sat under a, a barbell like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot about you that. know, I had never done a bench press yeah. like it just it, that wasn't the kind of 
workout I'd ever really done. And yeah, he taught me how to deadlift and squat and, you know, started teaching me some Olympic lifts and just pushing my capabilities. When I think about that from a, um, a matchmaking perspective, we talked about how many people I've, you know, we're working with right now who have not dated or have not dated seriously. Yeah. And how intimidating that is for someone to go into a social interaction, unlike one they've ever had before and have to quote unquote perform, right. Or have to um, demonstrate the skill that they're supposed to have. Not It doesn't come naturally to people, right? Yeah. Sometimes people need coaching. So I think one of the main things of that was that it was great for him to be able to um, help me push what I was comfortable with and, and track my improvement. Um, okay. Now mm-hmm. take all that information and yeah. apply that to matchmaking. Yeah. So I think um, helping me do hard new things was really important. Yeah. Similarly to what I do with people who are dating. I think also understanding my goals and the contingencies that I had to work with would be the other thing as a matchmaker, you know, I learn if people have children, if those children have special needs, yeah. if there's a certain kind of, you know, um, custody structure that they're working within. Right. Yeah. And I learn about their own health and well-being, and I learn about their mental health and I learn, you know, whatever they're willing to tell me about their lives that would impact what they can do in relationship and what the other person needs to be able to bring to the table. Yeah. Right. And that's huge. Uh, I honestly think that's a really big part of it is because like going to the whole like Andrew being in your corner thing Mm -hmm. is you are searching for people who are good matches, not just for you, but also your circumstances. Yeah. Megan, when she's doing her matchmaking, is in your corner. Mm -hmm. And she is taking your request and preferences very seriously and spending a lot of time looking through your profile, not your profile, your your bio, your summary that Megan writes about you, and is taking all of those considerations into account. Yeah. So if you have not already talked to her, be as transparent as possible with her mm-hmm. when you are doing a consultation in the future, because that will help you more in the future. Yeah. So the takeaway, if you're, so as a, as a man, let me ask this. Yeah. How do you feel about the idea of working with a personal trainer for, for some kind of a physical goal? And I, I love the idea. Do you think most men are If I open? could afford it, I would do it. Yeah. Do you think most men are, um, you know, are open to that kind of approach for that physical improvement? I think, I think men are the most susceptible to it. Susceptible is, sounds kind of negative. Well, no, what I mean by it is we are literally raised our whole entire life with coaches. Mm. Yeah. If you're, if you're a guy who's involved yeah, in most sports. Yeah. Pe- most people think it's regardless of the sport. Mm-hmm. I, I think this is a, this is definitely a blanket statement, but I think most men have participated in sports at some point in their life. Blanket what, statement for sure. It is a blanket statement, but I mean, that could even be cross country. That could be, it doesn't have to be a contact. T-ball. T-ball. Yeah. It could be anything like that, like yeah. kids soccer, whatever it was. But that being said, the coach is there to show you how to push your body to your limits Mm -hmm. in a safe way Mm -hmm. um, and to also get build confidence in you, hopefully, that you are able to do more. Yeah. And also to recognize your strengths and weaknesses and learn how to build your strengths and also your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And so your coach's job is to see you as a player. Mm-hmm. And to say, hey, how can I mold this person into being a better version of themselves? Yeah. Having someone in your corner that sees your situation mm-hmm. and says, I can cater your preferences and your situation into finding someone that fits you, going back to matchmaking, by the way, um, is such a huge step towards opening your world and finding someone. Okay. I have one last sort of uh, metaphor sure. to unpack with you. And we've talked about this, I think, in other places like, um, you know, online and, and how we've talked about matchmaking. But my favorite metaphor for matchmaking is that it's like working with a realtor. Yeah. From a masculine perspective, what's the appeal of working with a realtor versus just trying to buy or sell a house as someone who has now bought a house? Yeah. Um, going through that process. 
Um, I think when I we were initially looking for a house, I was a lot more hesitant to use a realtor because mm-hmm. I knew that they get a cut of it and I didn't want to pay for it. But the funny the you know, the funny parallel with this is we were shopping four hours away. Yeah. And so when we were um, originally looking, we only could see th- what people showed us on Zillow. Zillow or Realtor.com or... You mean like the pictures that they yeah, had Yeah, that's posted. what I'm saying. Like yeah. whatever whatever was being shown on there was the only reality we had. Right. And so I had, you know, I had my own, what I thought was like you know, real estate smarts that I thought I could figure out and break down the price per square foot based on acreage and how at the end of the day I knew nothing so ultimately it wasn't until we started working with Chase who was our realtor at the time mm-hmm. he gave us so much peace of mind you make a really good point that I hadn't even thought about with this parallel which is really funny how we were relying on sites basically yeah that uh you know were just showing us a handful of curated pictures yeah very similar to the online dating space these days. Very much so. Where people are taught to just rely on their instinct based on a few photos. Yeah. Um, and as we found out with our real estate shopping, photos can be misleading. Oh, very much so. And what? Do you remember that one house we went to that had the possums yeah. the, or the raccoons or something that was like living inside the house? Yeah. I hate to use this comparison, but also photos don't distribute like the sense of smell. <laughs> for houses for houses i mean particular. people too i people guess too. But, but you know oh. there's a couple of houses that looked great and remember that trailer that we went to in like reddick and it was cool property cool uh-huh. concept we walked in and it smelled like mildew yeah and we got an inspection turned out it was full of mold right you know so we're like oh well that was a waste of time yeah yeah but it wasn't until we started working with chase who was going by these houses and was seeing this stuff first and yeah. was like already knew the realtors that were selling it and they knew uh, he knew certain realtors were kind of scummy and they usually did not care about their clients so he knew to like avoid that house because of that so that being said kind of going to the fishing and hunting guide slash personal trainer slash realtor it's like he was in my corner um, saying, hey, I've been around the blocker time or two in this area. Mm-hmm. Um, and I now know what kind of property you're looking for, what right. kind of house you're looking for, what size, um, and what level of correction you're willing to make to the house, too. Mm-hmm. You know, he knew we weren't looking for a brand new house. And, and not to compare that to people, but like, right. <laughs> but it's it's he knew our preferences and he was sending us all of the houses that he thought matched and you know you know what's funny is a lot of them were kind of what we wanted but there were small things that we were kind of like eh, maybe not that one maybe that one not that one maybe that not not that one but what's funny is he gave us so many more choices Mm -hmm. he gave us the ability to say hey here's what's there that you do not see and gave us the understanding of like here's what's for sale in your area yeah, it's interesting because, like, so we, we've talked a little bit about instinct, right? Yeah. And how, like, Chase in this example, a realtor, had developed sort of an instinct around, this is the kind of house you can probably aim for, this is what you'll find in this area, this is the kind of realtor you can trust, like, yeah. you know, had yeah. understood the lay of the land. If you're a, the average person who's dating, who has not found a partner yet, chances are you haven't developed a really bulletproof instinct about how to ask the right questions yeah. to find someone who's a good partner. Now, I don't want to make it sound like I did tons and tons and tons of dating myself or that you did, but I have done 130 ish interviews with people directed at figuring out what kind of a romantic partner they could be. Yeah. So I'm not here to say that I am a dating expert in the sense that I can look someone up and down and listen to them say a few things and know what kind of a spouse they're going to be. But I do think we've developed an instinct about how to know that someone's authentic and how to make sure that their actions line up with what they say and do and what questions to ask that are going to kind of 
bring out that one little nuance that we need to understand, right? We've been practicing that. Yeah. And if you're someone who hasn't dated much, you don't have the instinct because instinct is just practice over time. Yeah, right? It's exactly. just practicing something so much <laughs> that it like, becomes natural. It's going to sound a weird way to say it, but like exposure experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so if you haven't dated much and the dating scene is confusing, that's okay. You, sh- you aren't going to have just a natural instinct about how to navigate it, but work with someone who has developed the instinct of which questions to ask. And in the real estate world, that was invaluable, right? Because Chase would be like, you know, so ask things that we would never even consider asking, right? That's very true. He yeah. was asking us questions that if I was trying to buy a house for sale by owner, I would have completely overlooked. Yeah. The other part of the real estate metaphor that I want to get into, and this goes back to the coaching thing we talked about before, um, is that, you know, we didn't have the experience of selling a house before we bought this one. This is our first home that we'd ever bought. Yeah. But usually if people are moving and they own a home and they're going to use a realtor, that realtor is also going to help them prepare their home for sale. Yeah. And the way that I like to describe it to people is if you are dating, you are looking for someone to become your emotional home and they're looking for the same thing. That requires some preparation on both of your parts, right? You need to do some internal cleanup and repair to get ready to invite someone into the emotional home that you've cultivated in yourself for them. Mm-hmm. And I want people, I want to be really clear about this. I'm not talking about dropping 20 pounds and getting a six pack. No, no, no. Right. Or changing your personality. But, you know, so well, I'll just kind of tease yeah. this. Do you have any examples? Yeah. Like think about, okay. So with, obviously without saying names. Right. Um, I, so let's talk about this first. Like, if, if you walked up to a house that you wanted to, to look at to buy and the windows and doors were boarded up, yeah. right? No matter what it says in the specs, no matter what kind of finishes it says are inside, there's no way that you as a person who's trying to look at the home are going to come away with a, a sense of confidence that it's the right one for you yeah. because you can't get in. Sometimes there are barriers that prevent people from connecting with people and they don't have anything to do with who that person is inside or what they bring to the table or what they value. It's just a barrier that's preventing connection. One example is I work with someone who um, has a very, very distinctive pattern of speech, especially when they're nervous. Yeah. And when they're trying to talk to someone, they, they talk at like a million miles an hour. They don't leave room for them to ask questions. Right. That was something we talked about as part of their process. Yeah. And I was able to kind of help coach them on like, hey, you're going to need to leave some room in this conversation for them to speak. Why don't you try to ask more questions and make statements? And, you know, I recommended things like put a sticky note on your computer when you're in this date that just says slow, you know, just to kind of remind (laughs) you that you need to take a breath. And it worked. Like it it worked. And they had a great interaction um, and matched with someone. And that was kind of cool. Um, So I think... You you need to understand that working with a matchmaker is not just about here's a list of my criteria and I'll go find someone. Yeah. I'm also going to come back and ask you, okay, but this has been blocking you before. How are we going to open this up for someone? And I again, I'm going to emphasize this doesn't mean that we want to change people. No. Because the barriers that we're talking about are not barriers that have to do with who you are as a person they have to do with small behaviors and habits sometimes you know or things like hey you you don't look at the webcam when you're talking and it, it makes it someone hard to connect with you right yeah. or you sent me a picture that's just not flattering of you and i can tell that it's not flattering because i've seen you face to face like let's find a better one yeah sometimes it's as simple as that where i'm here to help you put your best foot forward and kind of deliver on like that um you know, realtors talk about curb appeal, right? Yeah. Or baking cookies in the house before someone walks in, yeah. right? How do you make the space of your heart and yourself inviting to someone and let them know that you're happy for them to be there? Yeah. One of the things I loved about this experience so far is now that we've done so many consultations and now that you've done so many dates. What's cool is 
you're able to build knowledge and understanding of what people are looking for Mm -hmm. in terms of connection. Not Mm -hmm. necessarily, again, not going to like just about like you need to dress prettier or anything like like that. that. It's more, it's more about the, the, how do you, how can you build connection over a webcam? Yeah. How do you create the right atmosphere in in an undeniably awkward situation? Oh, sure. And the thing is, is we're not expecting you guys to fall in love at at first sight, but it's one of these things that if you're biting your nails the whole time and like, looking at your phone and not paying attention you're naturally not going to be a very appealing or attractive person to like not a good conversation partner not not a good conversation partner exactly like so one of these things that megan's had the opportunity to do is say we've had one person go on three or four dates you know and it just hasn't worked out and that's okay like that one person that's been on those three or four dates is also getting sometimes feedback from the partner they've gone on dates from Mm-hmm. And Megan can take that feedback and see one if it's constructive or not, mm-hmm. and two, word it in a way of saying, "Hey, two or three of these people have said the same thing. Right? Let's work on this together." Yeah, I mean, it's about I. Th- I think first we give people access, right? Yeah, and then we also help them sort of become as available as they can be, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of the confusion I think in our dating culture is, is because we, we don't connect as well in person as I think we used to. There's some data around this, right? Like as a, as a culture across the board, we're finding it more and more difficult to create deep interpersonal relationships. Yeah. Right. Um, and you know, I can't fix that entire global problem, but help having someone who says, Hey, making this tiny change might help you build connection Yeah, can be really valuable. Um, and it might be something that you're just not aware of, right? We're creatures of habit. We, we do lots of things over time that, you know, are just unconscious. Being able to have a, a neutral kind of third party look at what you do and say, Hey, you know what? If you tweaked the way you said this or how you approach this, a whole nother world might open up to you. Um, is kind of cool. And I think, you know, we're, we're also learning all the time. I mean, I think one of the benefits of working with someone like us is that you're like, we're studying this, like, yeah, we're talking about it constantly and talking to people about it. And I'm, you know, trying to do as much research as I can about human connection. So we're going to keep adopting the approach as we learn, you know, um, and hopefully making it easier for people to, to connect. Okay. So recap. We talked about why men might be hesitant to use matchmaking and we talked about other ways that they might ask for help in, in modern society because they need, you know, they, they want expertise in certain areas. So whether they're fishermen or hunters or are looking to improve their physique or looking to buy or sell a house, those are spaces where people are comfortable asking for help and, yeah. and where it doesn't diminish someone's sense of masculinity, right? Knowing all that, what would you say directly to men who might be listening who are just really hesitant about the idea of using a matchmaker? I would have to say just give it a shot Mm. because there's very little to lose. You're not losing time because you're not changing your course of time. You're not going out of your way except for an hour interview with you or me and maybe an hour date if it works out and that's all you have to lose and if you don't like it that's okay you don't you don't have to use it at the end of the day when you meet with these people there's no pressure to be dating this person after this Mm -hmm. you know after you go on that date it is not a requirement okay you like this person now you have to date this person you can choose to either do another date session with you or me, or you can choose to exchange information and get to know them better. And if it doesn't work out, it's okay. We've already had several people say, hey, I think I want to get to know this person better. And they would text for a little while and talk on the phone and FaceTime. And after a couple of weeks, it just didn't work out. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. But guess what? They only wasted two to three weeks of their time 
uh, yeah, two to three weeks actually is kind of a lot. In most cases, it's like a week. Like, yeah. They talk for a few days and they kind of know. Yeah, and so that's the thing is going into the date, you already know this person meets most of your prerequisites, if mm-hmm. you want to call them that, of like all the big questions. So now all you have to do is spend time getting to know this person. Even the, Here's the thing. Even with a fishing guide, even with a hunting guide, there's not a guarantee you're going to find that stuff. Mm-hmm. There's not a guarantee that the fish are going to be out that day. There's not a guarantee that you're going to find the biggest buck around. But your odds are a lot better. But your odds are so much better. The odds of you finding someone that is amazing is high. Mm -hmm. And sure, it's a risk. But just like in fishing and hunting, it's also a risk that you could lose your money. Mm -hmm. You know, you might go out and the weather's not good and the fish aren't out. Or you have a, you know, you have a rainstorm and something happens. You know, like you can, there's so many parallels to that, that this is just going to increase your odds of finding someone. So all that being said, it's not going to hurt to give it a try. Also, price wise, matchmaking costs significantly less than a guided elk hunt in Colorado. Oh, 100%. Hey, if you are listening from Colorado or another state somewhere in the you know, northwestern portion of the country that has guided elk hunts and you have a connection, send us a message. <laughs> no, just kidding. Please do. Yeah. If you're single, we can hook you up. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll trade. Take my dad on a guided elk hunt. And, and, me. and me. And Steven, and we'll do our best to find you a spouse. That's right. There you go, dad. <laughs> Happy late birthday. Early Father's Day. Um... But I mean, on prices though, if you want to look at matchmaking a non-Christian site. Oh yeah, you did this. You yeah, did research. So I did some research in this, and I and without going behind paywalls, it's hard to see some of their full pricing ranges. But I, you can look at reviews and stuff, and the cheapest ones I could find were in the range of two to four thousand dollars. That's nuts. For just matchmaking, the thing is, is like after so many dates. You have to pay per date after that. Oh my goodness! So on 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 the couple I looked at, but it was it was astronomically expensive. So in terms, of, if you're a frugal person, this is also the cheapest way, and you're going to find apostolics. <laughs> yeah, specifically apostolics. That's the beauty of this. So I think we've covered a lot of ground. If you are a gentleman who's listening to this and you are still on the fence about matchmaking, and you have questions for us, you can always reach out in an email. Um, or find us on our social media and reach out. If you want to speak directly with Steven about, you know, sort of from a, a guy's perspective, we understand too that working with a woman can be weird, right? Yeah, absolutely. And Steven does consultations. Like yeah. Steven will meet and has met with gentlemen in the project um, to do their consultations instead of me. So, Well, and it's just easier for men to be transparent with a guy. Sure, understandably. So that's an option too, but we want you to feel like you can approach us and talk to us and ask about, you know, what we do and know that there's not a stigma about you doing that. Um, And yeah, if you're listening to this on Monday, April 1st, and you know, this has convinced you that it's the right approach, go ahead and sign up today so that you get that $100 discount. Yeah. One of the things that we didn't talk about yet, uh, speaking of asking questions is our questions email. Yeah. What is it? (laughs) It is questions at synchrony project.com questions with an S questions. Um, and yeah. Hey, y'all that are listening to this podcast, I know there's like at this point at least a hundred of you. <laughs> woot woot. Um please leave a review. Oh, it yeah, that'd would, be really it helpful. would help us a lot and help us get help get this message out to more people. Um good or bad. We'll take all reviews. Yep, just engagement is great. So rate, review, s- subscribe, smash like smash that like button. <laughs> smash that like button. Ugh. Whatever platform you're listening on. All right, guys. Uh, Happy Easter or happy day after Easter. Yeah. Happy post Easter. Yeah. Enjoy your Reese's eggs. Hey, babe. Yeah. I love you. I love you, too. You know how many people are like, this is so cringe. When we do this part? Yeah. They can get over it. (laughs) Don't be jealous. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. You could be like us. No, God, Steven. (laughs) (laughs) He didn't mean that, guys. (laughs) He's sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm just kidding. Anyway. Kind of. 
<sighs> okay, well. I mean, sappy like us is what I was going for. Yeah, we are sappy. Yeah. That's true. Okay, well, on that note, we've covered Easter, guided egg, no, guided elk hunts. <laughs> guided egg hunts. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole new. So, well, we got to stop. Anyway, all right. All right. Bye. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>